Margaret Sinclair, Sister Mary Frances of the Five Wounds at Merrillick House, Worley. Early in 1925, Mother Abbess wrote to the priest who had guided Margaret into religious life to say that Sister Mary Frances had spat blood and doctor diagnosed tuberculosis of the throat and advised that she should be sent out of London to give her a chance of recovering. She had been sent to the fine nursing home at Worley under the care of the Sisters of Charity. She was bright and cheerful and full of trust in our Lord, and so the priest thought no more about it except to remember her in his masses and prayers. A little later, another letter came from Father K. S. J., asking him to go and see her if he chanced to be giving retreats anywhere near London. Margaret was suffering, of course, very much physically. She suffered from prostrating weakness, from constant breathlessness and choking in her throat, etc. She suffered also from loneliness, being outside her dear convent and away from her mother abbess, and from humiliating necessities caused by her sickness. She was crying like a child all the way as she was being taken from her convent to the nursing home at Worley and whispering, it is God's holy will. Then too, she had to be transferred from one part of the house to another because her distressing, racking cough disturbed others. Happily, she had not to bear this change for long. She was taken upstairs again after a few weeks. Father T. S. J., who saw her on that occasion, told the superior that although the tears were rolling down her cheeks, the smile was always there, and no word, no breath of complaint or murmur ever crossed her lips. She was always thanking God for everything and saying how good he was to her. And she was so worthless. She even remarked to the Sister Superior one day how she had at Worley all she could have wished in her own convent, for she always saw the grateful side of everything and never the faulty side, saying, The life of a poor Clare is one of prayer and penance, and I have that now just the same. It is prayer and penance. She suffered also by having to wait so long for death, and she was longing to go. Many times we read the litany for the dying, and she held the blessed candle in her hand with her crucifix and vows, etc. But over and over again she was disappointed. She always remained calm, however, and resigned to God's holy will. Meanwhile, the disease had advanced rapidly and she had been anointed and so the priest went to see her in the beginning of August, fearing that she might be in some trouble and trying hard to imagine what it could be that she needed. It was a fine, warm day, and the place was very attractive, quite suited for a sanatorium. He explained his object to the sister in charge, and he was taken up to the second floor to a large room, scrupulously neat, with large windows, wide open, and just one bed facing one of these windows. Margaret's face shone with holy joy as she saw the priest coming in with the sister of charity and chafing her 
as a spoiled child. They are spoiling you here, are they not? No, father. She is a very good patient, interposed the sister of charity, as she withdrew, leaving the priest sitting near Sister Frances's bed. Are you quite happy, child? Yes, very happy. Is there anything worrying you? No, father. Our Lord is very good to me. Then, after a pause, he has taken the cross away from me. Have you much pain? No, not much. Father, if I do not get better, they will not let me take my perpetual vows. Do not worry, child. Our Lord made you take your first vows. He will see to the others himself. You know, our Lord is with you always. Yes, Father, he is always with me, like playing with me. You know, when I took my vows, there were lots of people and things, and he asked me whether I liked all that, and whether I would not rather be alone with him, and I only wanted him, and I never got ill before my vows, but only afterwards, and he showed me how he sent the sickness afterwards, one morning, when I coughed and spat blood. Have you some nice name for him? Sweet Jesus. Does he ever answer? Yes, my love. Did you ever see him? Yes, very sad. So there you are, child. You're not to allow the devil to worry you. Our Lord loves you. And what else matters? Nothing. Now tell me, child, did you hear him with your ears? No, just within me here. Was it with your eyes that you saw him? No. Did you feel anything? No. Shaking her head most decidedly. That is right, child, for those things are very dangerous, answered the priest. Father, I cannot say my office. I try from early in the morning, but I cannot do it. Our Lord is always with me, she said almost tearfully. Do not worry, child. You go on trying to say it, but if our Lord seizes your soul, then let him do as he pleases. And if the time he holds your soul is the time you would have taken to say your office, then do not worry any more about it. It means that he does not want you to say it that day. Thanks, whispered the child, with a look of joy and gratitude, which baffles description. So also, with all your vocal prayers, child, and with all the indulgences, I am giving you a dispensation from those vocal prayers. Your aspirations and union with our Lord will be quite enough to gain all the indulgences. Then the priest asked her whether she was given Holy Communion daily. The chaplain brings me Holy Communion twice a week. Did you ask him to come every day? No. Again the priest questioned her what books she read and she showed him the imitation and the New Testament. He asked her what chapter she liked best, and she pointed out the seventh and eighth chapters of the second book of the Imitation, but she loved best the fifth chapter of the third book on the effects of divine love. Then he took her New Testament and explained to her from the epistles of St. Paul and from St. John's Gospel the great mystery by which our life is linked to our divine lords and through which every smallest detail of our own life acquires an infinite value in the sight 
of God and spreads his blessing to our fellow men. Her eagerness and joy knew no bounds as she listened and noted each passage for her to read again afterwards. She could still do a lot for her sweet Jesus, even though confined to bed and living in a grand room and attended by a sister to nurse her. Now I must leave you, child. Would you like to go to confession? Yes. The priest left her for a few moments and then came back to hear her general confession. He blessed her, gave her his vow crucifix to kiss, enrolled her in the five scapulars and went away, hardly able to restrain tears of joy. The child had never committed a single deliberate venial sin in all her life, muttering to himself, She is all right, Lord, thy bride, happy to have been privileged to penetrate a soul espoused to Christ. Some additional notes. Andrew remarked that his sister Margaret was fond of fine drapery and jewels, and now our Lord seemed to invite her to choose him again above all things. The new code of canon law gives to confessors the power to change all conditions for gaining indulgences except the essential one, for which the indulgence was granted. In regards to Holy Communion, this was only a temporary arrangement on account of the sickness of the priest in charge. The usual rule is to give the sick Holy Communion four or five times a week, and Margaret received it daily again later on. The sister in charge wrote to the priest later in the year. I had the great privilege of nursing Sister Mary Frances for about nine months. During that time, she gave me very great edification by her heroic patience in bearing her sufferings, which were indeed very great. She never complained. One day, when she suffered very much at night, she said to me, Oh, sister, this has been a glorious day. I said, why? She only smiled sweetly and said, a day of great suffering. One always felt she was offering her sufferings for poor sinners. She once said, if I could only gain one soul for Jesus, it would be worth it all. She seemed to always live in the presence of God. Though always recollected, she made no display of piety, but it was easy to see that she was only occupied with her divine spouse. Jesus was her all. She was truly another little flower, always so humble, charitable, ever ready with a helpful, kindly word, and so grateful for the slightest little service, she would say she was so unworthy. One could see she had a real true spirit of mortification, which she tried to hide. One could never find out her likes and dislikes. Sometimes, when she got her meals, she would smile. Once when I asked her why she did so, she said, The good God always sends me what I wish for without asking. Yesterday, I was just wishing for that, and here it is. Oh, how good Jesus is. One evening, about two weeks before her death, she became so ill and exhausted that we got her the holy viaticum. 
I stayed beside her bed for some time after, and I shall never forget the beautiful expression of her face. I could not take my eyes off her. It was a heavenly look, and she kept smiling. I thought at some heavenly vision. After a little while, I said, Sister Mary Frances, are you smiling at the angels? She answered in her usual calm, reserved way, perhaps. I then said, did you ever see our blessed lady? Her answer was, yes, sister, no more. Whether she saw her then or not, I do not know. All who saw her were struck with her and asked her for prayers, especially priests. One father wrote to ask for her prayers, referring to her as that beautiful character, the little poor Claire nun, the simple, charming, spiritual beauty of her soul and face haunts the memory. She had a most wonderful love for her holy vocation and often spoke of the life and how she loved it. I often said it must be so very hard, the broken rest and the food, etc., and felt she must be often hungry. That, she said, was a real joy to feel. It was a big trial to her to be away from her community, but she always said, God wills it. She was very faithful in doing everything exactly, as far as possible, as she did it in the convent, in a true spirit of obedience. She loved to speak of heaven and the joys to come. She had a great desire for holy communion. One day, she had a very bad fit of coughing and a wasp got down and stung her throat. This must have caused her dreadful pain as she suffered a good deal from her throat always. Still, she was calm and smiling. It was all the will of the good God and another wee bit of the cross.